everyone, and welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California for our program tonight called From DC to Silicon Valley to Hollywood, Leadership Lessons We Learned Along the Way. We're very glad you're here, whether you're here in the audience or you're watching or listening online. If you are here in the audience, um, lucky you, after the program, of course, stick around, take the elevator up to our rooftop. We've got some delicious food, some wine, we're gonna have some book signing, and a great chance to meet our speakers. We want to thank Ancestry for generously supporting tonight's program, and we are proud to partner with the APA Heritage Foundation to help celebrate AAPI Heritage Month. Um, the Commonwealth Club, for those of you who don't know, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan, or public forum, and we produce about three to 500 programs every year, even during pandemics. So head over to commonwealthclub.org to find out upcoming programs you might want to catch in person, hopefully, or online. Um, as well as seeing podcasts and videos from past events. Now, in addition to our in-room audience here, of course, we are live streaming this and recording it for podcasts. So if you're here in the room, please put your cell phones on silent or vibrate or just turn it off or break it. I don't know, whatever. Um, those of you who are watching online, of course, can let your phones do whatever you want. Um, however, if you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box to write uh, questions for our audience, excuse me, for our speakers. We'll work some of them into our conversation here today. Um, so now, it is my pleasure to introduce Claudine Chang, the president and founder of the APA Heritage Foundation and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Claudine, welcome. Thank you, John. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy AAPI Heritage Month. I think we, um, and to the audience also, uh, that are viewing this program at home. Um, the month of May every, uh, every year in this country is celebrated as Asian American and Pacific Islanders Heritage Month. So um, we are very happy today to be joining this program at the Commonwealth Club. Um, the APA Heritage Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our mission is to promote appreciation and awareness of the diverse Asian and Pacific Islander heritage and culture, and to collaborate and to have and to create opportunities for community collaboration. So this is a great example of what we are doing here today, and I can be make me happier to be doing to be having this program at the Commonwealth Club, which I also call home. Um, today's program is take leadership lessons that we learned along the way. I think there are so many, and I so look forward to this program. So it gave me. Great pleasure to um, introduce our panelists today. Ah, before I, before I forget, this is the Michelle Miu show. And so uh, Michelle Miu is a fellow member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors. Um, her program is amazing. I actually f learned about her programs before I met her. So I'm a good uh, fan of the program. Uh, the program really focuses attention on many issues that faces our city, our country, but more importantly, it gives voice and presence to women and the community of color. And we really treasure this program, the Michelle Mill Show. And so Michelle, and today we have three guest speakers, amazing women. I can't wait to hear from all your experiences. Uh, first, we have Deb Liu, um, the president and CEO of Ancestry and author of Take Back Your Power, 10 New Rules for Women at Work. We so look forward to learning what the 10 new rules are. And then we have Congresswoman Marilyn Strickland with us, Congresswoman from the uh, the state of Washington, I understand, just got back to the, into the, to the country, and we really welcome you to San Francisco, Congresswoman. And last but not least, we have Ab Abigail Hill Wen. Abigail is a filmmaker and author of ah, author of many books, Love Boat Taipei, wow, and Love Boat Reunion. Uh, I understand that there are books uh, up front that all of you please get a copy uh, when you leave this panel. So. Without further ado, we welcome our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Oh. Thank you so much, John, and thank you, Claudine, and happy AAPI Heritage Month. Thank you to all of you who are here in person today and all of you who are joining us virtually. I'm gonna extend those thanks also to say thank you for 
getting up today and doing your daily, taking care of your family, saying hello to your friends, sharing your thoughts and opinions, especially if you're affected by the most recent incidents and challenges that are occurring in the world, really. The shooting in Texas of our Korean sisters. We can't forget a year ago, the mass murder of our Asian sisters in the massage parlor. We'll never forget our Asian sister who was pushed off of a train platform or those who've been followed and murdered. And these are really, really hard incidents, traumatic even for all of us to fathom. But getting up and taking care of each other, taking care of our community, continuing to be there, to be in solidarity is one of the ways in which we can take back our power. And I think that that is going to be the heart of our conversation today as we learn from these leaders here, our Asian American sisters who continue to do the work every single day. So let's begin our program. Lately, you know, I've been thinking so hard and so much about what it means to be an Asian American woman or an Asian woman. And sometimes, you know, the meaning and, and the description of it is actually already in place before you even come into this world. So I'll ask uh, each one of you here up in the panel, you know, what it meant to you, to your family, your cultural background to be an Asian woman. We'll start with Abigail. Yeah, thank you, and thank you all for being here. I, my parents actually come from the Philippines and Indonesia, and before then my grandparents came from China. Uh, and in Asia, people don't think of themselves as Asians, they think of themselves as from the country that they're from. And so it was only in the United States when I was among others who were not Asian and American that I started to solidify that identity. So I was born in West Virginia, grew up in Ohio, um, where I was one of the few minorities in town, and I didn't actually know what I was. People told me that I was actually black, and I was confused as a child, I'm like, I don't think I'm black, um, but you know, there just, there just wasn't anyone of, that was different in the same way that I was. And so I was kind of put into a category with people who were other. And I think that f forced me in some ways to really come to a stronger sense of what it meant to be who I was. And over time, that's something I developed um, as I grew up and got to know other Asian Americans and, and learn more about my heritage. Congresswoman Strickland. So thank you for being here today and thank you to those who are watching. So my story is a little different, but it's very similar. So I am half black and half Korean. I was born in Korea and when our family came to the States, we landed in Virginia in the 60s where it was illegal for my parents to be married to each other. And my father was a military man. So we end, eventually ended up in Tacoma, Washington. And I think about what you just said, Abigail, about you know the otherization if you are not white. And how it feels when people treat you like you're something exotic or something different. As far as your identity at home, I tell folks that if you are raised by a Korean woman, you are indeed a Korean person. But I'm often asked, you know, what, do you consider yourself black or do you consider yourself Korean? And so there's always like this false choice I have to make. And it's like, no, I'm a combination of all of my cultures and heritage. As far as being part of the, you know, AAPI community, I go back to the time in which I grew up where there was a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment coming off of World War II that was still hung over into the 60s and 70s. And so I think a lot of people who were of Asian heritage, like my mother's generation, her friends took American names. They worked very hard to not teach the language language in the house because it was about assimilation. And as an adult, I think to myself, assimilation into what? What you realize is that our experience is the American experience. But coming up as a child, maturing into an adult woman, the country has changed and evolved. And I th with that, we now have a chance to have a very large platform and a stronger voice with our identity. Mm. I love and that. Dan. Yeah. You know, I, um, my parents came in the 60s um, when they were allowed to come. Basically, right. they came here to come to college. And they lived in New York City. And I lived very close to my relatives. And so I grew up speaking Cantonese. And my relatives lived down the street. And then my parents decided when they were six that they were going to move to a small town in the south. Mm. Um, partly it was because the discrimination at work. My dad, they didn't recognize his engineering degree and his friend said, come down, work for the government, they have to recognize your engineering degree. And so he picks up our family and we moved to the middle of nowhere to me, which is a small town in South Carolina, and that's where I grew up. And I remember going from a place where I never 
realized I was Asian. It just never occurred to me that I was different than other people to every day someone reminding me that I was different, that I was the other, that, you know, what are you? It was constant, where are you from? And when I say New York, they say, really? No, really, where are you really from? And I would say New York. And, and I just remember thinking, well, what is the right answer? Like, what am I? And having that existential crisis for most of my life. And I realized that part of me just wanted to hide. If, if you know, no one noticed me, if I never said anything, then maybe they won't make comments, they won't ask me questions. And that's, you know, when I talk about Take Back Your Power, it's really about finding my voice after all those years of pretending and hiding and trying to be as unexceptionally, you know, as, and, you know if, if no one commented. And so really taking, taking a step back and, and really growing up, and having that experience reminds me that, you know, being an Asian American was something that I just didn't even recognize. And when I did, it was something I wanted to hide. And I decided later on that that wasn't something I wanted to hide anymore. And that was really the coming of age for me. Mm. Thank you so much, all of you, for sharing. It would be another program if I, you know, added what it means for me uh, to be an Asian American woman. But very briefly, uh, you know, it meant that I could not be in media that career is a no. It meant I could not be a lesbian or queer because I'm, uh, you know, I'm meant to be with a man and bear children. Mm -hmm. and, and all of these things, right, that we were taught in some ways of our growing up that we were supposed to be somebody. So we're going to get into that. Why don't we start with, you know, recalling a moment in your, your life, your career, in which you walk into a room and you're pretty much one of the only ones, one of the only women, one of the only AAPI person, um, or maybe even both, right? We'll start with Deb. You know, I recently went to a CEO summit. Um, I became the CEO of Ancestry about 14 months ago, and I went to a CEO summit, and I looked around, and I realized I was the only woman of color in the room. It was probably about 90% men, and, um, and I just, I, it, it took me a second, and I thought, okay, I belong here too. And I had to just remind myself that I was here and that even if I was the only one, at least there is one <laughs> sitting in the room. And, you know, it, it took me a second to kind of process it. And, you know, that it was that same feeling of growing up in a place where I was really different from everybody else and everyone would look at me and ask me questions. And, but I realized that in some ways, like, it was an honor to be there as well, to represent our community, to be a person who could represent us well. Um, but I hope someday that that's going to be really unexceptional. And in my back of my mind, I said, I hope I come back five years, 10 years from now. And there's so many people who look like me that it's unexceptional. And that's my hope for everyone and for all of us that in our industries, that we're not somebody who's exceptional and different and not belonging, that we have that sense of belonging for, our, for everyone. Congresswoman Strickland? You know, I think about the path that I've taken in my career, and it has not been linear by any stretch of the imagination. And I've tended to end up in spaces where people least expect to see me, which means you're often the only something. And I'm a lot of firsts. I was the first I was the first African American to be mayor of my hometown. I was the first Asian American. I'm the first Korean, one of the first Korean American women to be in Congress, the first African American from the Pacific Northwest. And I often say, it is an honor and a privilege to be the first, but you never want to be the last. And so how do you, you know, to your point, you know, how do you normalize this? And I think about the different spaces and how people are sometimes surprised to see you there and just how they respond to you and how sometimes when you are trying to make a point, they will talk over you, around you, through you, not call on you. Or when you want to say something, they want to cut you off, but they let people who don't look like you speak as long as they want. And so, as you all know, these spaces have been challenging to navigate, but this is why we must be present, we must be accounted for, and to my point, we want to be the first because we're an honor, it's an honor to open the door, but you never want to be the last. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So when I went to Harvard, I was, um, I was taught by a lot of women who came before me and they said they told us about their experiences being minority women in their workplaces and they said we would stand on their shoulders, yeah. we were going to enter a different world as equals and I thought we were equal when we came out. We were hired in equal numbers. My law school class at Columbia had slightly more women than men mm -hmm. and that actually was the first time the first year and out of law school again we were hired in equal numbers but it wasn't until I started to move into leadership that I, that's when I had that moment when I looked around and I was like wait there is no one here like me. Mm -hmm. And some of that was actually attrition where a lot of my, my female peers took smaller careers or they, yeah. they ended up staying home with their children. Um, they actually 
at, when you have kids, uh, like for me, like at least the bar went up for job satisfaction. And so I found like for my friends that were not finding job satisfaction at work, that felt they were encountering glass ceilings and discrimination, mm -hmm. it was no longer worth it once they had children. And so there came a period when I looked around like, wow, I have, my network has vanished. And I talked to other women who said that that actually happens to women, something I'd never realized would, would happen. So I think as I started coming through the ranks and I began talking with my managers about like, okay, I'm interested in growing as a leader, I'm interested in managing, that was also a moment of dissonance when, when the language I heard back was, wait, you want to manage people, and it was really something that was very foreign to them, and, and these were people who didn't go to colleges um, with me and my, my peer group that I'd come up through the ranks with, and I think, I realized they just never had seen anyone like me in a leadership right. role, and that was where I started to have to find other paths and to become a creative person in my workplace to figure out how do I find sponsors, how do I find mentors, how do I convince these people who had responsibility for my career to see me for who I was and what my abilities were. I'd like to add something too yeah. to what you said because you talk about your leadership journey and how people weren't used to seeing you and we have a very western male notion of what leadership is. Mm -hmm. Who fits that role, how it looks, how it acts. And sometimes people think of, you know, a man who uses a very commanding tone of voice, pounding fist on the table. And I Han think Solo. when they see us, you know, <laughs> that's not exactly who they think of or who we come across as. And so I think that even the whole idea of who is a leader, what does a leader look like? And more often than not, sadly, it doesn't look like us. Great segue then to my next question. And we'll start with Abigail. I mean, so then what does Okay, obviously, you're all very successful. And getting to that position of being considered successful and in leadership, we see a lot of people who don't look like you and not even you know, the same um, gender. So then what kind of woman is successful, if that makes sense, like to whoever's in that leadership? How do you get to that position? And, and what do they expect of you mm. to, to be a successful woman in leadership. We'll begin with Abigail. So I actually think we need to cast off those expectations, <laughs> um, and that is how you get there. So Love Boat Taipei is actually about a group of Asian American kids who go to Taiwan and they rebel all summer. And you know, this is actually based on a real program that I attended uh, growing up. And I believe that those skills of rebellion against the um, you know the bureaucracy, the hierarchy was, was actually useful. In Silicon Valley, we reward the disruptor. That's what we're looking for. And so I think the same is true for being a woman in leadership. Like we have to do things that are different and that's the value that we bring, frankly. I have heard so many times, oh, that doesn't seem appropriate or that seems inappropriate or no one's ever done this before. And then that makes me immediately think like, well, why hasn't anyone ever done this before? And maybe we should be. And I think a couple examples. So when I was coming through the ranks, breastfeeding at work, mm -hmm. completely taboo, right. um, completely inappropriate. I heard it in the halls of Congress, actually, mm -hmm. where there would be some women gossiping about the woman breastfeeding in the bathroom or, or pumping in the bathroom, rather. And now I'm so thankful when I walk around the airport and I see facilities for breastfeeding mm -hmm. and I see rooms that have been taken over in schools for the staff who are, are pumping. Um, and so that's an example, I think, of just ways that things shift over time, but only because a woman is in charge and said, we actually need these facilities. And so I think that's kind of what we need to bring to the table as women, um, as people who see things from a different point of view, we will have eyes to see things that other people in leadership traditionally have not. Congresswoman Strickland. Well, it's interesting you talked about the breastfeeding because we actually passed a bill in the House mm. requiring employers to have breastfeeding facilities at businesses <laughs> so that more women can participate in the economy. But you know, I think about um, the the conversation about you know how we show up and and what it means. And you know, I think about the work in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. When I first started working back in the Stone Ages, you know, diversity was a really big deal, and they would have a diversity committee. And of course, they try to find every person of color and put them on the committee. And I remember thinking, we're not the ones who need to have this conversation. And so I think about the evolution of that whole DEI conversation and what it means now. And you know, when I think about it now, you often hear companies or organizations saying, we want you to come to work as your authentic self. And then when you are there, they're not ready for that. Mm -hmm. And so what does it really mean to live those values and to be inclusive? And I would say, you know, for me, and everyone's at a different stage and a different place in their career, and you work for different organizations, but for me, it's like, you know, I don't need to prove my competence anymore. 
What I do need to do, though, is let my guard down and tell my story and let people know who I am so they can relate to me more. And so for me, when I think about leadership for me at this stage, people just get to, I want people to get to know me, to know my personal story, because that is the most effective way to connect to people. And when people are in leadership positions, if people trust you and they feel some affinity with your experience, that actually makes you more successful as a leader. Mm. I love that. You know, I was just reflecting on what Representative Strickland said a little bit earlier, which is, you know, our style of leadership, what we look for in leaders is a certain type of person who has led for the last hundred years in business and in media and in Congress. You know, that is the model. And often when we are, are asked to lead, we're asked to lead in a model that doesn't fit. You know, I grew up in a very collectivistic culture, right? Mm-hmm. It's very, you know, Asian Americans are right. taught, keep your head down, do the work, you know, people, you know, people recognize your hard work, that's how it works. Right. And then you come into the workplace and you realize none of that is true. Mm-hmm. That if you do the work and you put your head down, you don't, you know, your team doesn't get any recognition, you don't get any resources, you're not fighting for the things that you want, you realize you have to speak up in order to succeed. And that was so difficult for me yeah. because I grew up in being taught all of these things and then finding out when it hits you in the face that it's not true. And I wrote a lot about this, um, and I, I wrote this article about what it was like, you know, finding my voice as an Asian American mm-hmm. leader. And I'm not what a leader looks like. If you are going to imagine, so when I became the CEO of Ancestry, they told the leadership team they would meet with me, but apparently they didn't tell them who I was. So they gave them a, a Zoom link, and I showed up. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, you know, you should Google me right now because I think <laughs> I am not what you thought. You know, I yeah. would be on the other side, and and it's okay. You know, I you know I'm okay with that. But at the same time, I remember when I wrote this article about you know what what does a leader look like? It doesn't look like me. Mm-hmm. And I had learned all these skills in order to adapt. And I remember somebody who I really respected read the article before it was published, and she said, "Well, it just smacks of assimilation." And I was really crushed. Mm. Because when you say the word assimilation to someone like us, it's you're giving up everything that you believe, your heritage, your culture, in order to become someone else. Mm -hmm. And I thought long and hard about it, and I wrote her back, and I said, actually, I treat this as adaptation. That this is how we adapt to the culture that we live in Mm -hmm. so that we can succeed, so that we can make it okay for someone like us to be successful. And that, hopefully someday, it's unexceptional for people to breastfeed in the office. It's unexceptional that people like us are not sitting here because we're exceptions, but that there are many people like us. Mm -hmm. And so I've had to change the language and the, you know, the acceptance of what, what leadership looks like for myself. And I banned the word assimilation (laughs) from my (laughs) language. And I instead say, what does it take to actually overcome this obstacle? What adaptation do I need to have? Because adaptation is about survival. It's about thriving. And assimilation is about hiding. And I no longer want to do that. You know, and assimilation is about sacrificing your identity to be accepted, yes. to be taken seriously. And so I love your definition of adaptation because that's what we have to do to survive in this world. Yeah. Same. Wow, that changes my perspective <laughs> a whole lot. Um, uh, Abigail, could you talk a little bit about, because, you know, you have experience in the AI world. Mm-hmm. You know, how does gender, um, how does that get defined in the AI world? It's a a really great question. So there's AI, the industry, and the technology, and then there's AI, um, you know, the the corporate world, right? Mm -hmm. So I think AI, the corporate world, we've talked a little bit about that there's an underrepresentation of minority voices, which I think the industry is actually thinking very hard about and and doing a lot of great work. And then there's AI, the the technology, which, um, you know, we've seen some of the iconic headlines where the algorithms for human resources is not correlating women with leadership roles. And, and we see, you know, this is actually a harder problem to solve than it looks on its surface. It's not simply about making these algorithms or gender neutral. The problem is that they're mining data, historical yeah. trends. And actually what was fascinating to me to see this um, come out is that, you know, it's there in the data. Sometimes we can wonder, like, are we just making this up? Are, are we imagining mm-hmm. implicit bias? Um, is it really about qualifications or is it about, you know, something else? And when we saw that the, the algorithms that are churning through all this data um, was actually showing that you know no women actually are not being hired into these leadership roles in the same quantities, then then I think that was something that we had to look at. So um, we I think it takes a diverse team to dig into these complicated questions and figure out like at the margins like who what is why is it that the it's not a matter of just replacing names with gender neutral names because it could be that a whole group of people are taking ballet or football is being correlated with leadership skills. And so those are the things that a diverse team is needed to, to unravel. So again, AI and gender, um, it's complicated. 
and the people that answer the questions are the ones who can represent those voices. I think, Deb, you also talk a little bit about this in your book as well. Not the AI part, but uh, the part where the implicit bias does come into play, and especially in leadership and hiring uh, women and Asian women in leadership roles. Yeah, and I think, you know, the studies have shown that Asian women are actually um, underrepresented in leadership. Mm -hmm. it, even though they make, um, they make up a pretty large group, they're actually, they're, they represent leadership at a third of the rate they should, given their representation, which means that something is broken. Either they are unqualified and doing a terrible job, or there's systematic bias in there, and we need to unpack what that is. And I think that, you know, often there's, an, there's, a, there's a feeling that, you know, should you, should you be too assertive as an Asian woman? Right. You know, because that breaks a norm. And you pay a price for every norm you break. If people expect you to be a certain way and you're different, you do break that norm. And, and I think each one of mm -hmm. us have experienced that yeah. in our career. The hammer comes down harder. Yes. And so you oh, yes. feel like those consequences are so much greater when mm -hmm. you do something that is, you know, somehow out of step with what other people expect you to do. And yet at the same time to demonstrate leadership, you have to sometimes fight, you have to sometimes push. And so how do you navigate that? And that's been part of the challenge. And I think sometimes we hold ourselves back because we say, well, maybe, you know, if I weren't too aggressive, you know, but at the same time, you know, you look at leaders, leaders are assertive. They ask for what they want, they push. And so, you know, you're constantly trying to thread this needle between being, you know, collegial and, and a good partner. And at the same time, also demonstrating the leadership skills they're asking for to really get the best projects to, to make your team more successful. And I think there, you're constantly walking this tightrope. And I think all of us have experienced that, where you want to you know, say exactly the right things, but not say too much. You want to you know, you know, not call the people out for interrupting you, but still have an opportunity to speak. And I think that it is that cognitive load of living in a society where it's not built for us. The system was not built for us, and that's OK. We just have to figure out how to navigate it. And for some people, it's exhausting, and they quit. And they, they say, you know what, this isn't worth it. Yep. And I've gone through that as well. And so a lot of that is really the, the research I did as part of this book, just part of it was depressing, but then part of it is like we have more control than we think we do. And so for the things we can control, you know, we don't, we don't get to control what happens to us. We get to control what we, how we react to it. So a lot of that is how do you take back your power in the times that you do have, and you have the opportunity to do the things you want to do. Oh, yeah. Amen. Uh, uh, Congresswoman Strickland, how does this play out in the public service world? I mean, to me, uh, politics and <laughs> getting to the level yeah. that you're at, I can only imagine, you know, how much of a how, a how much of a fight that it actually is. You know, it's interesting. So, you know, I, I thought about what you said regarding what I call the double standard, right? Mm -hmm. So, when we do something that may we, we all make mistakes, and it sometimes mm -hmm. feels as though when we make a mistake, it's amplified a hundred times. But you see others doing the same thing, and it's no big deal, right? Yep. And then I think about you know the conversation about you know your voice. The I think about the stereotypes that people have of women, right? So, with being an Asian woman, it's like you know we're a gentle, delicate flower that is very low key. And I tell folks, if you've ever been to my house and seen the women in my family, we are anything but low key. But there's the persona that you put forward and the expectation that people have. And so, you know, how do you find your voice? And, you know, I, I tell folks that, you know, as someone who is Korean American, African American, you know, I spent a lot of time being my mother's interpreter. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to help a parent navigate the world, you don't have the luxury of mincing words. So my communication style has always been very direct. So, you know, do you want to do this? No, thank you. And I tell people, no, thank you is a complete sentence and it's not rude. And so even the way we think we're supposed to communicate versus how we normally communicate, it feels as though, you know, as women, as women of color, we are constantly policing ourselves. And at some point, we have to free ourselves from those shackles and say, I get to communicate just like everyone else does and it shouldn't be a mark against me. I had to work through that own internalized yeah. fear. And I remember talking to a mentor of mine, a woman who was yeah. an executive at the time, and she said, don't worry, the guys around me, they go to bat for each other all day long. Yes. So it's perfectly appropriate for you to do the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you know, um, these types of statements that you might hear in your career, right? Like, stop apologizing, mm -hmm. or you need to smile more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> share yeah. with us you know, some of these moments for you. Uh, we'll start with Abigail. Oh, this one is, is, I think I've blocked all those out. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, I definitely, I think I've heard, um, I've heard both, you know, you need to be more aggressive and you need to be less aggressive. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the hammer coming down harder is, is definitely, yeah. it's tricky. I think it's actually difficult for women in leadership to both gain, um, gain allies 
as well as to build support from beneath. And so I, have, I remember being in meetings where I was leading a billion dollar deal and there was a new man that joined the team, very disrespectful on the phone. Mm -hmm. And I used to internalize things like that and think there's something wrong with right. me until I started talking with my other girlfriends, finding out they were all having the exact same experience. And so I think that information sharing was really critical so we could debunk some of these things that we were being told that you somehow deserve that or your leadership style isn't, isn't appropriate or isn't working for you know, the world that you're in. You know, I think about the whole conversation about leadership, finding your voice, and I would just say realistically, you know, there just kind of comes a point in your evolution as a human being when you're just comfortable and you're okay with the consequences. But if you're starting your career, if you are in a leadership position for the first time, those things can be very daunting. And I think it's very important. You know, we talk about mentors all the time, but we really grossly underestimate how important it is to have someone who has been there, who has done that, and is going to tell you very frankly, not just to cheerlead you and to say everything you're gonna do is okay, but sometimes to tell you and to put you in check. And I think those those things that we think about in our, in our journey as leaders is interesting. And, you know, I think about the women I know who are Asian American, who are my mentors and my leaders, you know, entrepreneurs, women who have done amazing things, and women who have stayed at home to raise families by choice, which is a really hard job, by the way. And so the mentors that you have can come in many, come from many places, but you have to have that group of people who are in your corner, who are willing to support you, but also to call you out when you're not doing what you need to do. Mm. Deb? Yeah. I would just say feedback is a gift. Yep. But sometimes you don't have to accept every gift. Exactly. And you have to decide. You have to decide. The, the gift that they give you is the opportunity to glimpse at what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. And then you get to decide what you do with it. Yeah. And I think sometimes we feel like we need to take it all in and then you know, change ourselves. But how can, you, how can you be less aggressive and more aggressive at the, at same, the same time? time. And right. You hear a lot of contradictory <laughs> feedback in your life. And you kind of have to decide, well, what, why would they say that in that circumstance? What am I doing differently that I can yeah. do better? And yet at the same time, sometimes that feedback is... Maybe how they felt, but maybe it's not a general statement that you mm -hmm. need to change. And so just being really careful to accept the gifts that in the, in the spirit in which they're given, right. to thank them and then say, I'm going to process this. You don't need to keep every gift that you're given. That's so true. <laughs> I'm going to process this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that tomorrow. Um. <laughs> what about, you know, having to prove your, your worth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and your talent. So, you know, I started off and I, I told you I'm, I'm not supposed to be in media. Right. I was actually supposed to do something uh, like you've all have heard before, you know, be in law or be in, um, in, med in medicine, be a doctor. But for you, what has been the experience in proving your talent and your worth? Abigail? So this one I think is really hard. Mm -hmm. um, I did go through a period where I was working with people who didn't see me. Mm -hmm. They couldn't see my, this is the, the same manager who said, you want to manage people. <laughs> and I tried very hard for many years to be seen and to try to prove my worth and I just never get there. And it wasn't until I connected with another manager who had actually had a similar background, had gone to Harvard seven years before me and worked at Goldman Sachs while I was at Sullivan and Cromwell, so big Wall Street law firm, big Wall Street um, iBank. And, and he saw me. He's like, what are you doing, Barry, in this company? You know, you should be doing X, Y, Z. And so he, you know, he, sent, he gave me these deals. He sent me speaking on artificial intelligence around the world. And, and that was night and day for me. And that was when I realized, oh, you know, I didn't actually have to spend, spin my wheels trying to prove myself to people who couldn't see me. I need to find the people who can. And, and that's what I've done ever since. I love that. Congresswoman Strickland. You know, I would say that when we think about proving your worth or showing that you're capable, we sometimes assume that it has to be in front of a large audience. Mm -hmm. And that isn't necessarily true. And so, you know, I think about just the evolution. I remember when I, gra so I graduated from University of Washington, and then I got a graduate degree from Clark Atlanta University, which is a historically black college and university, and I came back home to Washington State. And I was looking for jobs, so I had to lunch with someone, and I was just like, you know, just raring to go and trying to prove myself. And I remember this friend of mine said, he said, you need to just calm down. <laughs> you know, just, just chill, just, you know, and so you're something, you know, you're so anxious to show that you're worthy and you're, you've got this degree now and you're gonna go f set the world on fire. And I think sometimes you know, when we think about this whole idea of proving yourself, we focus on saying, I'm gonna do it on the biggest stage on the planet. Now, being a member of Congress is a pretty darn big stage, but I think also too, we have to remember that wherever you are in your journey, you know, your competency is going to show up in the proof of the work you do, but make sure that the people in your organization are fully aware of your role 
And this is really hard for women mm -hmm. and women of color. So like, take credit for the work because I promise you somebody else Absolutely. will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love that. I recently <laughs> wrote an article, you can read it on LinkedIn, um, about um, how to get promoted. And you know, the first item is do the work, but there's nine other items. Right. And I think sometimes you think, okay, do the work, like that's it. That's and, it. and I said, you know, it starts out, I was talking about, you know, we treat promotions and, and recognition like yeah. it's some surprise coronation. It's right. like you do the work and suddenly someone says, hey, here's a, here's a crown. I love yeah. that. <laughs> and instead, how about you actually do the work? But the second thing is amplify your work. Yes. Tell people, if you did the work and no one knows about it, did it happen? If you did the work, you said someone else, like, you know, who's going to take credit for it? And, you know, it's not someone just for well, you. I can tell someone them they will. They will. And the question is, <laughs> what happens to your team if that happens? Right. Like, will you get more resources? Will you help them get promoted? If you don't want to do it for yourself, fine, but do it for the people around you who are working hard on the same project as you. And then, the, you know, I, I talk about some other things, but the other two I think are really important is have a manager that sees the magic in you. And that's what, you know, Abigail's talking about. Like the night and day difference between someone who believes in you, mm -hmm. someone who's shining warmth towards you as opposed to giving you the cold shoulder, mm -hmm. it's night and day. You're going to do your best work if someone is there seeing you and believing in you and pushing you to do more and saying, I believe you could do 10 times more than this. Let's go figure out a plan. But the last tip is actually change jobs if you don't have that. Yep. If you're in an organization, if you're stuck mm -hmm. and you're, you're feeling like you can't move forward, sometimes it's just the wrong fit. And it's time to cut bait and move to the next thing and actually find those things that you can thrive in. And that's a hard thing to say. We all have the sunk cost fallacy, right? It's this yeah. thing where, but I committed so much resources and so much time and I did all these things and I have you know, all these connections. But sometimes the best thing is to start anew to press the reset button. And you know, that's, that's as you kind of look at your, your career and your life, sometimes the reset button is the most important thing. You know, they, they say that men are promoted on potential, but women on performance. Yeah. But if no one recognizes your performance where you are, you might as well start in a place that will. And so really give yourself that opportunity. And you know, as I, as I was doing research for that article, I just, I talked to a lot of people and I heard all of their challenges and that's how I put it together. And I just said, you know, the one thing is if you have a sponsor, if you have a manager, if you people believe in you, that's magic. And you know, everything else, there's a prerequisite of actually doing the work, mm -hmm. but without all these other pieces, you can't thrive. You know, and I would also add this too. I mean, I think about there, there's this thing that exists now that allows you to just amplify and it's called social media. Mm -hmm. And so you can talk about, if it's not classified, the project you worked on, you can thank your team, but there's a way to get the information out there that didn't exist a while ago. Yeah, and help each other. And we yeah, absolutely, each other. and amplify each other's voices. Thank you, Commonwealth Club, for seeing me and giving us this platform and opportunity to have this conversation. That's right. <laughs> um, just a couple more minutes before I uh, turn over to audience questions, so thank you for submitting them. Uh, gosh, this conversation is so mind-blowing. <laughs> And I have so many questions. I wanted to talk about the the part where, yes, right? Like if the, the space is not treating you well, you're not being seen, or you don't have the sponsors and managers, maybe it's time to hit the reset button. For all of you, you reached a point in your career in which you could afford to say, hey, you know what? I'm shooting for the stars. I'm going for what I want. So let's talk about, you know, that transition and um, for yourself, for example, Abigail, you know, being successful in the artificial intelligence industry, I'm pretty sure they did not want to let you go. Uh, <laughs> having gone through Harvard and law school, I'm sure somebody expected you to become a law professor. Uh, and here you are today. You're an author of, uh, and a young adult, you know, author and writing about romance and um, fantasies, and then now filmmaker, right? Right. The, the books are being turned into films by Netflix. Congratulations, by the way. Thank but you. so we'll start with you. You know, that moment in which you can afford to take a risk for yourself and going for what you want. So yeah, when I, when I look back, I see all the footprints leading me to where I am now, and it does feel like it's the confluence of all the things I've done before. So filmmaking is actually, you know, I've heard it described as the intersection of uh, technology, 
finance and creative mm-hmm. storytelling. And that's exactly what my lives, my past lives have been. Um, but I also see the same thread going through everything. I studied government at Harvard, mm-hmm. international relations. I came from an international family with, with parents from different parts of Asia and, and going back to visit as a young child. And I would hear stories about um, you know, global conflicts. The perspective I learned about US foreign policy in Ohio in school mm-hmm. was very different than the perspective that my family in the Philippines had. And you know, we'd, so I, I grew up always knowing that there's multiple stories to be told. And I, I, I went to law school because I cared about social justice. But what I found was, as I started working in law, in tech, in artificial intelligence, like all those social justice themes that I cared about were still going to be played out wherever I was. And that's, you know, whether that's through hiring practice, through promotions, or in venture capital, where we found a lot of women did not have access to mm-hmm. capital, women and, and underrepresented minorities. And so actually, when I was um, at my VC fund, we started a fund specifically targeted towards minority and um, and women, and, and that was important um, because we found that the questions that were being asked of men, uh, male entrepreneurs, to, to Deb's point, like it was about their potential, and to the females, it was like, what numbers do you have to back right. up what you're doing? And, and oftentimes, people could never get there. They just right. could never get comfortable with that team of women um, or of, of a female founder. Um, so for me, all those things, all those, those themes in my life, international relations, social justice, um, implicit bias, uh, these diverse experiences that we have and that we can bring to the table, those all have come together in my creative work now. So Love Boat Taipei was a group of over 30 different Asian American characters, and I wanted to showcase that diversity that's in our community that we see, but that wasn't reflected in media. So my characters are funny, they're sad, they're, <laughs> they're doctors as well as entertainers, and, um, and they fall in love. And I think showing that human side of us yeah. is also really important. We, we make bad decisions, we make good ones, we fall in love, we have friendships, we have drama, <laughs> like it's all there in our community, and it's part of what makes us human, and, and being able to showcase that through my work now, and to reach so many people through the work has been really such a joy. And then same thing with La Boat Reunion, it's about a girl in tech. It's about Sophie Ha, who is my girliest girl from book one, <laughs> the cheerleader who's boy crazy, thought she was supposed to get married to a rich guy, and then in book two, she's now a woman in tech, and she's trying to be her full girly self, um, which I love in a world that's predominantly male-dominated. And, and that's something that is important to me. I have future books coming, more film work, and all of them kind of address and touch on all these themes. So I'm grateful to be able to bring it all together now. Mm. Congresswoman Strickland, I mean, you went from successful in pri- private sector to public. Yeah. So making that big jump and leap to something that you're really passionate about. Talk to us about reaching for what you want. Yeah, I mean, I think that it takes you a while to get to the point to figure out what you do want, but you definitely, along the way, figure out what you don't want anymore. And I think about, you know, my first job out of college was for a large insurance company. Then I worked for a nonprofit organization. I went to graduate school. And I said earlier, my path was not linear. When I came back to Washington State, I was working for this really um, small coffee company I hadn't heard of. And they were just about to go into the Chicago market. And it was Starbucks. Mm. (laughs) And so I think about, you know, again, just public sector, private sector. And, you know, I was recruited into public office. And like a lot of women, my initial response was a checklist of all the things that would hurt other people in my life if I decided to run for office. Mm. And I was finally talked into it. And there's a punchline to this story about who talked me into this. So um, there was someone who was a former mayor. He was the former speaker of the house in Washington state. But the punchline is that he was my guidance counselor when I was in eighth grade. Oh. <laughs> so he was the one who said to me, you should probably go into politics. Mm-hmm. And when I finally ran for city council, two years later, the person who ran, for, who was the mayor was termed out. So I declared my candidacy to run for mayor. And I remember the daily paper called it audacious. Mm-hmm. So I won that race. It was a very close one. And I think, you know, that was, you have these moments that give you confidence. And I remember, you know, my husband says to me, every time there's an election, he goes, are you ready to win tonight? I said, I am. He goes, are you ready to lose tonight? I said, I am. And I think the mindset of understanding that it could fail miserably in front of the whole world is something that gives you the strength to try and do big things. And I think about in the terms of electoral politics, it's not the embarrassment of losing because you'll get over that pretty quickly, but you feel so horrible that you're gonna let people down. Mm. The people who donated to your campaign, the people who volunteered for you, the people who went out and knocked on doors for you. And so I think sometimes as women, you know, again, putting everyone else first instead of thinking, I should be a member of this body because of my life experience and because that voice is so desperately needed. So sometimes our default position is, how does this affect everyone else as opposed to saying, no, I need to be there because 
I have responsibility for every single person who is denied civil rights to be there now and to continue to do the work and to make sure that more people are part of this society and are treated with respect and dignity and have their rights as well. I love Thank that. you so much. You know, one thing we didn't talk that much about is our husband and kids. And, you know, I, there's a quote in my book from Sheryl Sandberg, the most important career decision you ever make is who you choose to marry. Mm. And I met my husband when I was 18 and I have three kids with him. And, you know, we've been together for many years. If I tell you how many years, then you'll know exactly how old I am. <laughs> um, but I actually, you know, I, I think that a lot of that risk taking, the ability to risk take mm. is if you have, you know, a spouse who is the safety net, somebody you can yeah. fall back on. You know, somebody with health insurance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, somebody, you know, I went to a startup coming out of business school and he was working at a law firm and the startup worked out. It's called PayPal. Yep. And just like that. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I thought, well, you know, I'll join the startup. What's right. the worst that could happen, right? right? And, you know, we support each other. And I think that for, you know, having a supportive partner, having, knowing that you have a safety net, someone who can pay the mortgage if something goes mm -hmm. wrong, that is an incredible amount of freedom that I think we underestimate. And I think we as women don't always talk about having a partner who's there, who's doing you know, half the household management, who's, you know, making sure the kids are fed tonight. Those are, those are really important parts of, of success. And I think sometimes we forget to tell that part of the story that the self-made woman is some, some all by herself, but actually, you know, in, in any successful relationship, in any successful career, there are, is a group of people who make that possible, whether it's your spouse, you know, your parents, the people around you. And I think that, you know, to write them out of the story is really unfair. And so, you know, you ask like, how do you kind of say this is for me? Like when I decided I was going to to explore a role as a CEO, my husband and I sat down and we talked long and hard about it because we knew what that would mean for our family. And he was incredibly supportive and he said, look, we'll figure this out and here's what we'll do. But you know, each time we've made decisions, we made it together. And I, I want to make sure he's not here tonight because you know, he has another obligation. But you know, when we were talking about each step of the way, every decision we made, we made together. And it's that level of support that makes it possible for us to do that. Uh, I want to add one thing, though. So when I started my career in politics, I ran for city council. I was a single woman, mm. and I was going to take a huge pay cut if I got elected to office. When I ran for mayor, my husband and I were seeing each other, but we were not married at the time. And I remember people saying, like, have we ever elected a single woman to be the mayor of a city? But they, no, that, I mean, that was actually held against me, right? My marital status. Mm -hmm. And I think about women in leadership and how that often comes up in conversation. And there have been times in my journey where I felt as though no matter how accomplished I was, no matter how educated I was, the question always came down to, do you have a spouse and do you have kids? Because that was the measure of your success as a human being. And so I just wanted to kind of put that out there, yeah. just kind of like the entire, the, the, you know, just, just, just the entire, all the parameters that come with being a woman in leadership and the expectations that people have. I think you're telling all of our stories in here. <laughs> I mean, you know, it wasn't until I put a ring on it that people actually trusted me because I think they thought that I was out there at the uh, queer bars every night. I mean, I still am, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to yeah, ask some uh, questions from our audience. These are great questions, okay, by the excellent. way. Thank you so much for submitting them. What is the single worst bit of advice you have ever received? Oh. So I, I think that you know, to hit the moon, you have to shoot for the moon. To hit, to, if we're going to colonize Mars, we have to actually dream of colonizing Mars. And so I think we need to dream big. And I have had people in my life who have dreamed small for me. Mm. And I think that's when you have to turn it off. And it, even now, recently, uh, someone actually suggested that Love Boat, Tai like, why don't we try to make Love Boat Taipei into an indie film? Because they knew I, w I was interested in films. And I said, oh, it's actually already been filmed. It's done. We're working with Lionsgate and um, Ace Entertainment, which did, you know, to all the boys I loved before for Netflix. And and it was, it was kind of a big lesson to me, you know, that even now it's still there. And if I had heard that before I had my film deal, then maybe I would have gone that route, which is perfectly fine, but it just wasn't, it wasn't the bigger path that I wanted for the work. So yes, dream small is the wrong advice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go on. The worst piece of advice I received was um, someone told me that I should go to church because it's good for my career. Mm. And I said, you know what? I bet God knows why I do that. And <laughs> She, w she would not be pleased. <laughs> I think for me, it's, it's the way I grew up. My parents were very much, put your head down, you know, mm. do the work. And I don't think they understood the reality of what it takes to be a leader in, yeah. in today's workplace. I think, you know, my dad worked for the government. My mom had a, a series of, of different jobs. And, 
you know, it was just like for them, it was mostly survival and, yeah. and thriving in a country where you know their language skills were not as good and yep. they struggled in a bunch of ways. And so for them, they just said, hey, you know, like this is good enough. And when I wanted more, I think they were really surprised. And, you know, and even to this day, I think, you know, it was really surprising to them. And it's not because they don't love me. It's because, you know, they were really worried for me that I was going to do too much, that it was going to mm -hmm. be too much, yeah. that I wouldn't be able to have a family, that I wouldn't, you know, thrive. And so I honor them for, for you know, why they told me those things. But at the same time, that is that, you know, the, that was the thing where when they said, hey, we just, you know, you just, it's okay. You don't need to work so hard. You don't need to be the best. You don't need right. to, you know, and I was that kid in, in high school who was like, I'm going to get out of this small town. We'd get a college scholarship. I'm going to graduate number one in my class. I'm never going to look back. Right. And they just thought, why? What's wrong with this life? And, mm. you know, now I just looking back, I think, you know, they gave me the foundation where I am. And so I in no way fault them for the choices that they made or the advice they gave me. But I tell our kids, like, you know, dream big and, and want more. And don't just, you know, don't just do the work, but do the work, amplify it, and, you know, really thrive. Who are some of your heroes and sheroes? <laughs> well, I would say that, you know, I talk a lot about Sheryl Sandberg was my sponsor. And so I was very honored for her to, you know, I'm on the board of Intuit. She introduced me to Brad Smith, who was a CEO at the time. And she introduced me to him many years before I was on the board. And she said, someday he'll have a board seat open and maybe you can join their board. And I thought, I'm nobody. <laughs> I'm not, I wasn't even a VP at Facebook. I was like a director at the time. And I thought, this is insane. I met him and a few years later, sure enough, a board seat opened and she said, you should interview for it. And so, you know, she just opened up so many doors for me, things that I never would have thought to do myself. And I think I work really hard to pay that forward. And there's so many of those amazing women in my life who have opened doors, mentors and, and sponsors. And, and there's too many to name, but you know, it is those people who believe in you more than you believe in yourself, who mm -hmm. give you opportunities. And she was also the one who gave me the hardest piece of feedback, which was, you can stop fighting now. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of fight in me, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, you've won you've got to just take a step back. And I realized she was right. And it's somebody who's willing to tell you the truth, but also open doors for you. That's really precious. I, I would say that my two sheroes are my mother and a woman who is a businesswoman who's been a longtime supporter of mine. I'm Leah Armstrong. So I'll tell you a bit about both. So even when I'm having my absolute worst day, feeling sorry for myself, pouting, sulking, complaining, I think about my mother's journey as a young woman growing up in Korea during the Japanese occupation being forced to learn and write the language, marrying a black man in the military, coming to the United States of America with their baby, not knowing a soul, and all the things that she endured, but all the way she persevered. And I use the word resilience to describe her, but at the same time, I recognize that the word resilience means that you have experienced consistent trauma. Then I think about Leah Armstrong, who's a Korean American businesswoman who started out as part of a nonprofit organization to help Korean American women who were married to American soldiers just feel like they had a place at home in mm -hmm. our community. And from that, she ended up building an empire of retirement homes and was bought out by a company in Kentucky and mm -hmm. has done really well for herself. But she has never stopped giving back to the community. She does scholarships, she donates a lot, and she does it very quietly on the DL. And back to the conversation about everything you do doesn't have to be on a loud, visible stage. You can be very effective and you can lead with a very quiet, but very, very respected and profound voice. I have a couple as well. I would say um, <laughs> Justice Ginsburg. I have, so we had actually ha shared a number of things in common. She was also at Columbia Law School. Her daughter was on the faculty. I had a chance to interview with her for the um, for a court clerkship. I came in. She told me she sent me wrote, she wrote me a letter saying it was splitting hairs between me and another colleague. Mm -hmm. um, but she, you know, is an incredibly intelligent woman, um, a pioneer in her day. I loved the documentary and, and the film that came out on her life and how she was both. A mother, we, I remember when I interviewed her, we talked about having children during law school and, and just kind of navigating that world. Um, one of the things I loved, especially I think in, in one of the films was, uh, she was she was up to present for the court and her husband said to her, you just haven't had practice. And that's actually something I've seen a lot and this is why we, we have to talk about systemic mm -hmm. bias because there are a lot of people who don't seem qualified on paper because they haven't had those experiences. Right. They haven't had the opportunities because of prior biases. So, um, you know, 
uh, faculty for Harvard Law School, it used to be that one of the criteria was a Supreme Court clerkship. Mm. But there was a period when no women had Supreme Court clerkships. And so I think just having the eyes to see things like that was critical. And so I feel like I learned a lot from her example um, and also just as a person. And I loved that she went to the opera with um, her colleague, Justice Scalia, even though they sat on different right. sides of the aisles. And the other person would be my grandfather, who passed away a couple years ago. He left China when he was 18 and um, was separated from his wife for mm, 10 years, wow. but he stayed faithful to her. And 10 years later, they were reunited in Indonesia, of all places, and eventually moved the entire family. So I have 100 family members in California, thanks yeah. to him <laughs> wow. um, and all his wonderful children and grandchildren. And he's been a model, I think, of um, just joyful living. He's grateful for everything he has, despite all the things that he's come yeah. through in his life. Mm. Justice Ginsburg, I wish she was here, but I guess, you know, that's the torch that we all have to carry now, right? Um, is life easier or harder for young AAPI people today than 10 or 20 years ago? And maybe one of you can answer this question. Um, I will answer it in the context of how I've seen young people experience the world in the last decade. And I thank God every day that I did not have to live through my teen years with social media. <laughs> because it's a fantastic way to get to know people, to be in touch with people. It can be cruel and ugly and make people feel so horrible about themselves. Mm -hmm. So I just think that the challenges they face are different because we receive information and we interact with each other socially on a much different scale. So I would say that, and some of them have lived through you know, a recession, a pandemic, and so I would say maybe overall, they're, they remain optimistic, but at the same time, I just think that they have been through things that a lot of us have not. Mm. And uh, maybe this question is for you, Deb. How have you, as, as a woman leader, helped change the experience for younger women at work? Well, I think it's really being a, a role model of what's possible, right? I think it's, it's really, thinking hard about kind of what kind of atmosphere we want to create and how do we actually create inclusive spaces for people to represent their point of view. I think it's easy, you know, to have teams that are, you know, if you actually look at the studies, it's not the homogenous teams mm -hmm. or, you know, it's not the teams that are, that, you know, have all the superstars. It's really, how do you build psychological safety into every team? How do you actually talk about, you know, building trust and building relationships as part of, you know, team building? And it's hard. The more diverse the team is, the harder it is to build psychological safety, but the better performance you get out on the other side. And so really talking openly about why that's important, why diversity is important, why bringing more voices to the table is really important. You know, when you bring different voices to the table, you get more ideas, you're challenging each other, you're actually sharpening each other. And I think that really kind of saying that's okay to actually come together and to have teams open up, you know, that's a really hard thing to do. But at, at the same time, the results for the business is so much better because you're getting the best of everyone. And how about this question for you, Abigail? Um, so, <laughs> I mean, after everything, you're very busy right now, but what <laughs> goals do you still have hope to achieve? <laughs> oh my, I'm, I'm living it now. I, I love it all. Um, I have more books coming. I have more film um, things in the work, TV things that I'm looking at. Um, the, so Love Boat Reunion came out in January. Um, I have another book coming out next year and the film. Hopefully we'll, we'll have more to share on that soon. So I think it's, it's this, it's like, it's talking with people, it's meeting other allies, um, other women leaders, and, and thinking about how can we make the world more inclusive, more understanding, and how do we bridge communities? So, you know, I'll answer the question about uh, my Shiro's, and it's mm -hmm. all three of these leaders who are <laughs> sitting right up here who've made um, so much change and inroads for, for all of us. And I found myself, you know, doing the whole imposter syndrome thing, mm -hmm. where before we started, I was like, what in the world am I doing? What business do I have sitting next to these three individuals who've done so much? Um, and are so incredibly intelligent and amazing. Uh, and so I had to roll that back and be like, I'm up here for a reason though. Absolutely. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about imposter syndrome. How do you deal with it? And how do you make sure that you don't fall into it? Uh, over and over again as you continue to succeed. We'll start with Abigail. I think we always struggle with it. And, and maybe that's partly the world that we live in. Um, 
you know, there are voices that tell us that we can't do it and we can't be there. And we, we haven't had models. We haven't seen people like ourselves mm-hmm. growing. I remember uh, one of my um, faculty at my MFA program was an Indian American woman. She said she didn't know she could be an author because the only authors she ever read were dead white men, none of which applied to her. And I realized that was true for me too. I just didn't know I could be an author. And I remember even sometimes I would talk to people when I was, before I had a book deal, and, and they, would, they would laugh, right? Oh, well, that's, that's fun, but maybe you should you know, take it down a step. Or, um, or people thought like, oh, maybe you'll be like so-and-so and they'll, and they'll name one of these, you know, these dead white men. And, but they, they didn't really see me that way. And, and I think, frankly, I didn't either. Um, and so I think just ha- surrounding yourself with people yeah. who care about you, you know, to Deb's point, um, people who see the value that you can bring to the table. Um, I am here today because my critique partners continue to read my work. They were all published ahead of me. I was like, why are you guys still reading my work? Um, they had two books published and I had nothing. And, and, but they believed me and they kept me going. And I did hit rock bottom at one point when I had written five novels, they'd all been rejected. And finally, um, Love Boat Taipei hit. But they saw it and I wasn't able to see it. And so I'm grateful for that. Congresswoman Strickland? You know, I, I would say that I had this moment about a decade ago when I was in a room with some very, very accomplished people. And I remember going home that day thinking to myself, these people are accomplished and they're famous, I said, and they're really not that different from me. Mm-hmm. And this wasn't to denigrate them or what they've accomplished, but I think you just kind of have these moments where you're like, wait a minute, there's a moment of clarity here. So if you want to do something, if you want to be ambitious about something, you have every right to do it. And, you know, I'm going to get a little political here, but I think, you know, the president who served before Joe Biden pretty much erased any imposter syndrome that I would ever have about anything. (laughs) Because it just shows that, you know, if you decide that you want to do something and you have the support (laughs) network, anything is possible in America. And uh, you know, I, I think we do a disservice to kids. Like in school, there's like grades. You yes. can get 100. You, you promote in a, in a regular interval. You, you know, everyone goes together. And we just, we have this idea that like there's a class rank. When you get out into the world, someone's better at you. Someone's better than you at everything. That's right. Like if you just walk into a room, you're never going to be the, the best at everything. And so I think we kind of have this idea of like these exemplaries, you know, and, and instead, you know, what are you, what is, what are you best at that you are, you know, what is the U-shaped hole in the world? Mm-hmm. And if you just look at the world that way, then it's harder to have imposter syndrome because what you do is different than everybody else. And so one thing that I said I was going to do early on was I'm not going to be the smartest. I'm not going to be the best at all these things. But what I can do is I can learn faster. I can adapt faster. And if I just keep doing that, I will always be ahead of the game. And you know that has really served me well. So when I go into a situation I don't know something, I try to learn as much as I can. I do a ton of research. You know, I force myself to write an article every week, but I'm trying to learn something new every single week. And it's really, you know, accelerating your pace of learning is actually a really special skill that I've honed because I have imposter syndrome. And it's taught me so much more because now I can say, you know what, I learned that. I can learn this and I can do the next thing. And so rather than trying to seek to be the expert or the best at something, I seek to be the best at learning as fast as I can and adapting as much as I can. And that's helped me kind of not get into situations where I go, oh, I'm outclassed, you know, I'm not gonna be the smartest, I'm not gonna have the right answer. Instead of having the right answer, maybe asking the right questions is a better way. And so really kind of giving yourself permission to be who you are and creating a U-shaped space in this world, that's what's really special about each of us. And if each one of us look for that, then that place is just the place for us. And no one else can take it. Mm -hmm. Yes. I a thousand percent agree because I never know the answer, but I asked the questions. Right. See, that's great. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we have a couple minutes left, and so if you could all just briefly entertain me and answer my very last question, and that is, um, what would you say to the little Abigail or little Congresswoman? Well, was it a Congresswoman? <laughs> <laughs> little Marilyn, <laughs> little Dev, you know, that little girl who dared to dream. Uh, what would you say to her mm-hmm. as you are now? Start with Deb. I would say anything is possible. I just remember when I was little, I thought, you know, I, I dreamt small for myself. I came from a small town, you know, in the middle of what seemed like nowhere. And I just thought, you know, I remember telling my teacher, well, maybe someday I could be a paralegal. And she's like, why wouldn't you want to be a lawyer? And I'm like, mm. I could do that. Yeah. You know, it just never occurred to me when right. I was possible. And I just, I dreamt really small. And now that I see the possibilities for my kids, I talk a lot about like, 
if you have the world, anything's possible. Do what you want and imagine big. And I think, you know, sometimes we do dream small for ourselves. Maybe that's the advice I shouldn't have given myself. But, you know, looking back at the last, you know, few decades, I realized that, you know, you, you can accomplish something if you can imagine it. And if you just have a small way of imagining the world, and that's how I was. And so looking back, I think I should have forced myself to think much bigger. I would say for me, and I think a lot of us who are um, of um, Asian American, Pacific Islander ancestry, it's like, it's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we come from homes and culture sometimes where there is just so much pressure to do well, to be the best, to always excel at everything. And I think, you know, there, there comes a point when, you, you know, in your adult life and you realize, like, it, it's okay to try and fail because that failure doesn't have to define you. Mm -hmm. But what's going to define you is if you give up after one failure. And most people who are successful has had multiple failures in their histories. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that I would tell my younger self, like, it's okay if it doesn't work out. You're just going to give it another go and it'll be just fine. Yeah. And I would agree with, with both <laughs> those. I would tell both those things to my younger self. And I think I would add that, you know, I grew up very lonely. Um, I didn't have a lot of people I connected with. I was close to my family and I'm so grateful for them. Um, but I was, you know, it was one of the few in, in my community. And I think I would tell that little girl that you're going to have a lot of friends. You're going to have a lot of people who will feel seen by your work in the way that you didn't feel seen growing up yeah. and that there will be people who, who love you and, and that life will be okay. Mm -hmm. so. um, take all of that and tell myself, my big self, <laughs> my older <laughs> self that every day. Thank you all so much for this wonderful uh, program and happy APA Heritage Month. Let's give a round of applause for Abigail Hingwen, <laughs> Congresswoman Strickland, and Deb Liu. And so don't forget, for those who are here, you're in for a treat. We got some great food and also some, some wine, some beverages and refreshments for those who don't do the wine. Uh, it's all at the rooftop here at the beautiful Commonwealth Club. And so you get the view of the Bay Bridge and then we'll be doing some book signings. And also, uh, you can get a copy if you don't have it now. So we have both of Abigail's books here with us today. And then we also have Deb's book on pre-order. So lucky you. And for all of, the, uh, all of you who have joined us online, you can also get Deb's book on pre-order. And of course, you can order Abigail's book right away. And then Congresswoman Strickland, we're still waiting for a book. <laughs> <laughs> well, in all my spare time, I'm going to do one. Yeah. 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 There, there, yeah. there will be a book coming, though. I was actually telling someone that, um, again, everyone has a very compelling personal story, and I think I have a very interesting family mm -hmm. history to share. So one day, you'll get a book from me. All right. That's awesome. Can't wait. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all of you for joining us here for this program at the Commonwealth Club. Thanks all of you who joined us online. For more program information and some upcoming events, head to commonwealthclub.org. For Michelle Miao specific programs, you can go to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. We thank Ancestry for their generous support of this program today and also the wonderful partnership of the APA Heritage Foundation and Claudine Chank. We'll see you up there on the roof, and for those who are at home, we'll see you next time.